Many people out there would like to break habits that they feel don't serve them well. One of the challenges in breaking habits is that many habits occur very, very quickly. And so there isn't an opportunity to intervene until the habit has already been initiated and in some cases completed. There are a couple of tools that neuroscience and psychology tell us can be very beneficial. Some of those things are somewhat intuitive and relate to what I call foundational practices, meaning things that set the overall tone in your body and brain such that you would be less likely to engage in a particular habit or that would raise your level of awareness, both of your situation and to how you feel inside. So things like stress reduction, things like getting good sleep, things like quality nutrition, things like having positive routines arranged throughout your day, all of those, of course, will support you in trying to break particular habits. And while that can be very useful, it's admittedly very generic advice. It doesn't point to any one specific protocol. At the beginning of the episode, we talked about a form of neuroplasticity called long-term potentiation involving the NMDA receptor. It basically says that if a set of neurons is very electrically active, it's likely that over time, those neurons will communicate with themselves more easily because of changes in things like NMDA receptor activity, the recruitment of additional receptors, et cetera. It's essentially a cellular and molecular explanation for how something goes from unlearned to learned to reflexive. Now, in order to break synapses or to break apart neural connections that are serving a habit that you don't want to engage in, we need to engage the process called long-term depression. And long-term depression has nothing to do with a state of mental depression or a reduction in mood. So I really wanna be clear that when I say depression in this context, it has nothing to do with psychological depression. It has nothing to do with mood. It's simply called long-term depression because Just as long-term potentiation says, if neuron A triggers the firing of neuron B and it does so very robustly over and over and over again, then neuron A will not have to fire as intensely or as frequently in order to activate neuron B in the future because they become potentiated, right? The threshold for co-activation has been reduced. There's a much higher probability that they will be activated together at low levels of intensity. That's essentially what long-term potentiation is. Long-term depression says that if neuron A is active and neuron B is not active within a particular time window, then the connection between neuron A and B will weaken over time, even if they started off very strongly connected. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat that because this is pretty detailed neurobiological mechanism, whereby if neuron A is active, and neuron B is active, but at a different time or outside a particular, what we call temporal window, meaning outside a particular time window, then through long-term depression, the connection between neuron A and neuron B will weaken. And just as a point of interest, the NMDA receptor is also involved in long-term depression, although there are other molecular components involved as well. So how do you take two neurons that underlie a habit out of synchrony? How do you get them to fire asynchronously? This is pretty interesting with respect to the cellular molecular biology, but at the behavioral level, it's especially interesting. The way that one would do this is, let's say for instance, you have a habit of picking up your phone mid work session, okay? That's a reflexive habit I think that most people have experienced. And we often hear the idea that, oh, you know, the phone is so filled with with access to dopamine and incredible things that we're just drawn to it. But if you notice what's happened with phone use over time, most people, including myself sometimes, I admit, find ourselves just looking at our phone or find ourselves in a particular app without actually having engaged in the conscious set of steps of, oh, I'm really curious what's going on in this particular app. I'm really curious what's going on in this particular website. You just sort of find yourself doing it because the behavior of picking up your phone is sort of reflexive or has become fully reflexive. You see this a lot at meals where multiple people are there and no one's looking at their phone and then all of a sudden someone takes out their phone and you'll notice that other people just naturally take out their phone. It's this kind of observation-induced reflex. And I would wager that most people aren't consciously aware of the immediate steps involved. The literature says there are a number of ways to break these sorts of habitual behaviors or reflexive behaviors. Most of those approaches involve establishing some sort of reward for not performing the activity or some sort of punishment for forming the activity. I've heard of um, some basic things that people will do, like they'll even put like a rubber band on their wrist and every time they complain or um, every time they do some behavior like pick up their phone, they'll give themselves a snap on the wrist. The uh, the rationale there is that you're trying to create a a somatic, a, a very physical representation of something that makes it very real and harder to overlook. 
other people will just do a tick mark on a piece of paper. The sort of um, what gets measured is what gets ma- managed kind of mindset where if every time you do something, you take away the judgment. This is very new agey, I realize, but this is what you find out there if you uh, search the literature that every time you engage in a behavior, you just measure the fact that you, that you uh, did that behavior. You just mark it down at the end of the day. People are supposed to look at that and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I spent three hours doing something or I did it 46 times. And in fact, a lot of apps, social media apps will start to give you warnings now if you opt in that you've been on the app for an hour. Would you like to leave? Most people just click right past it and go back in. I think very few people uh, say, oh, oh my goodness, it's been an hour and therefore you're right. I absolutely shouldn't engage in this anymore. It's just far too easy to just blow past those reminders. The literature on habit formation and habit reduction, breaking habits, has been analyzed. There's a beautiful um, meta-analysis, which involves looking at a number of different studies all together, comparing the statistical strength of each of those studies, looking in different conditions, what sorts of habits were trying to be made or broken, notifications to either engage in habits or to not engage in habits actually were not very effective over time. They were effective in the immediate period when people started using these notifications, as were little sticky notes like don't go into the refrigerator between the hours of whatever and whatever, or visual reminders, physical reminders or electronic reminders were effective in the immediate term, but in the long term did not predict whether or not people would effectively stick to habits they were trying to stick to or break habits that they were trying to break. So sadly, that doesn't seem to work very well. And perhaps they just need to come up with more robust reminders. I don't know, mild electric shock or something like that. Because what we do know, only sort of kidding about mild electric shock, but what we do know from both human and animal studies is that things like electric shock, things like monetary penalties, right? Having to pay out every time you engage in a particular behavior. Those are pretty effective ways to break habits. The problem is when people are not being monitored for habit use, for instance, you can imagine a situation where you say, I'm not going to pick up my phone for the four hours in the early part of the day so that I can get you know, real dedicated focus work done. Unless someone's monitoring them, then people don't tend to monitor themselves completely enough that they punish themselves completely enough that they break the behavior. In other words, the, the punishment isn't bad enough in order to break the habit, which just speaks to how powerful these habits are once they become reflexive. They're just very, very hard to override. So it turns out that the key to generating long-term depression in these pathways is actually to Take the period immediately following the bad habit execution, meaning let's say you tell yourself you're not going to pick up your phone, you're not going to bite your nails, you're not going to reflexively walk to the refrigerator at a particular time of day, but you find yourself doing it anyway. And what actually has to happen is bringing conscious awareness to the period immediately afterward, which I think most people recognize. They realize, oh, I just did it again. I just did it again. And in that moment, capture the sequence of events, not that led to the bad habit execution, but actually to take advantage of the fact that the neurons that were responsible for generating that bad habit were active a moment ago and to actually engage in a replacement behavior immediately afterward. Now, this is really interesting and I think powerful because I would have thought that you have to engage in a replacement behavior that truly replaces the bad habit behavior, that you would have to be able to identify your state of mind or the sequence of events leading into the bad habit, but rather the stage or the period immediately after the bad habit execution is a unique opportunity to insert a different type of what we would call adaptive behavior, but that could be any behavior that's not in line with the bad behavior. So let's give it an example. Let's say you find yourself trying to do focused work. You pick up your phone. You're disappointing yourself for picking up your phone. You could, of course, just put it down or you, and re-engage in the work behavior. But if you were good at that, then you probably wouldn't have done it in the first place. So what turns out to be very effective is to go engage in some other positive habit. Now, this has two major effects. The first one is you start to link in time the execution of a bad behavior to this other good behavior. And in doing so, you start to recruit other neural circuits, other neurons that can start to somewhat dismantle the sequence of firing associated with the bad behavior. In other words, you start to create a kind of a double habit that starts with a bad habit and then ends with a good habit. And that seems to create enough of a temporal mismatch so that then recognizing when you're heading toward the bad habit becomes more apparent to you. So again, I want to make this very, very concrete. Let's say that the behavior is reflexively picking up one's phone. You do that. You think, oh, goodness, I did it again. Here's what I'm going to do. You would set that down and then you would engage in some other positive behavior that you've deemed positive. And here it's very subjective. So it's hard for me to give an example that 
will necessarily make sense to everybody, but perhaps you're working on hydration. So maybe you go have a glass of water. Maybe you are trying to do breath work or something. Maybe you're, you are trying to uh, enhance your language speaking skills. And so you go and you spend five minutes doing a particular type of language learning. You literally exit whatever you are doing and perform that other new positive habit in the immediate period right after that, even for a short period of time. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but what this does is it creates a kind of a cognitive and a temporal mismatch between the initial bad behavior, which before is what we would call sort of a closed loop. In closed loop, one behavior, one set of neural firings leads to another, leads to another, and then just kind of sets the same thing in motion. It can be kind of a self-perpetuating system. By changing the number of features that are in that loop, it disrupts the closed nature of that loop. It creates what we call an open loop. And in an open loop, you are better able to intervene. So as I mentioned before, this might seem counterintuitive. You might think, why would I want to reward the execution of a bad habit with a good habit? I don't want to reward myself for the bad habit. But really what you're trying to do is you're trying to change the nature of the neural circuits that are firing so that you can rewrite the script for that bad habit. A different way to put it would be, imagine that the bad habit is like a chord on the piano that you play or a chord of notes or a sequence of notes that you would play. It comes very easily. You can play it every single time. But let's say as you're trying to learn a new piece of music, you're just constantly inserting that at the inappropriate times. You just find yourself doing it. Rather than trying to prevent yourself from doing it, the next time you do it, add in a new chord or sequence that you're trying to learn. What this does then is it changes the whole nature of the sequence of neurons that are firing from bad habit through to the end of this newly applied good habit. This is the way in which you start to dismantle, or when I say dismantle, really weaken the likelihood that if neuron A fires, neuron B will fire. Because as you're starting off in the mode of very reflexively performing a bad habit, those neurons are firing together without you consciously being aware of it. It's almost impossible for you to intervene in yourself without a number of other features like severe punishment, um, severe consequence type outcomes. Rather, tacking on some additional sequences, like if neuron A fires, neuron B fires, and then you're saying, okay, well, if neuron B fires, I'm going to start inserting neuron C, D, E, F to fire, right? That's the C, D, E, F being the positive behavior that you're going to insert. And in doing so, you create a chain of neuronal activation that then is very easy to dismantle. When people have applied this kind of approach, it removes the need to have constant conscious awareness of one's own behavior prior to that behavior, which is very, very difficult to achieve. Rather, what they find is that they are able to engage in remapping of the neural circuits associated with bad habits in ways that are very, very straightforward, right? Because you can always identify when you've done the thing you don't want to do and then tack onto that something additional that's positive. The nature of that positive thing is important. You don't want it to be something that's very hard to execute. You want it to be something that's positive and fairly easy to execute so that you're not struggling all the time to insert this on top of this bad behavior. But again, this is rooted in the biology of long-term depression. It maps very well to the behavioral change literature that I was able to glean that really shows that rather than just get reminders, rather than try and instill punishment, rather than setting up reward for breaking bad habits, that perhaps the simplest way to approach this is to tack on additional behaviors to the bad habits, make sure those behaviors are good behaviors or behaviors that are adaptive for you. And in doing so, you will soon find that the initiation of the bad habit takes on a whole new form or that you're not even inspired to do it at all. 